Yes, and uh, sorry. So, okay, so um, to start off with, this is Osceola County right here. Um, so um, inland birding, um, you know, covers a huge rather area. I mean, that can really almost stretch from, um, you know, Ocala area all the way down to Okeechobee. And, and right now, I mean, some of the famed uh, um, shorebird spots um, are down in Palm Beach County. Um, you know, they got a lot of agricultural fields, sod fields down there, um, and that's been a real hot spot. So that's where you can get your real big numbers. Um, but, you know, if you don't live down there, you got to drive down there and everything, and you got to know where to go and stuff and, um, and everything. So um, they're trying to make everything a little bit easier, especially for us that live in the Orlando area. Um, we've got our, uh, um, our chain of lakes um, that we have here. Um, so looking at the map real quick, you can see Kissimmee up there in the top and then drops all the way down. It goes down to 160. That's down there. Um, that's now almost down to uh, Indian River slash Polk County is over here on the left. Um, and uh, so you can see Osceola covers all those little spots um, for green. Um, so that that's kind of a look. Uh, we'll go back to the, the map there in a second. But I just wanted to kind of let you all know a little bit about Osceola County, just because that's kind of where I'm concentrating a little bit um, here. Um, it was... Uh, um, as you can see, it was uh, uh, became uh, the 40th county um, named in Florida. Um, it was named after a Seminole leader, um, uh, Chief Osceola. Um, and then Osceola County was a transportation hub in the late, late 19th century with riverboats and railroad. Um, and the main uh, uh, economy was uh, cattle, sugar, um, and then lumber. Um, and unfortunately, lumber probably was a long time, long, long time. Um, and unfortunately, um, that was the demise of the red cock and the woodpecker race. Slowly been coming back. So beef was really it. In fact, I actually used to do um, in the city center. Um, they actually used to uh, uh, cattle drives right through the center of town. Um, the other neat thing about uh, Kissimmee is actually got one of the oldest uh, hardware stores. And I always mention that just because I worked at a hardware store for a couple of years, the manager. Um, so and it was an independent one and it's been around for a long time. And I try to go to it whenever I can um, there in the center, the old part of uh, Kissimmee, uh, right next to Lake uh, Toho. Um, so now, nowadays, since, you know, beef is what it is and sugar is kind of gone more south, uh, lumber, we well, they took away all the trees, so can't exactly do that. So what do we come to is sod fields. Now this has become the newest thing. Um, uh, the agricultural world, um, at least down here, has really hit sod fields. Um, fortunately, everyone likes their golf, uh, their subdivisions and golf courses. Um, so this supplies the sod fields beautifully. Um, however, it does create um, a bit of a birding, uh, uh, um, uh, birding area. Um, you know, as our shorebirds, as they come going south, um, after they've been breeding up in the high Arctic, um, they come all the way down through Florida and they, you know, all dot all along the Gulf Coast. Uh, we have a lot of wintering shorebirds here. Um, but for some of these ones that are going to be heading even more south, um, going down to Central um, and uh, um, uh, South America, um, you know, this is a, an important stopping ground. And thank goodness for Florida, we have a ton of bugs. We get a lot of water right around this time because this is when they're coming through. Um, and so it creates a nice food source for all these birds. So, um, like I said, sod fields kind of are now sort of the big uh, economy grower um, here in Osceola County and a lot of South Florida um, going that way. So, and once you get way down to South Florida, that's when you get into more of the agricultural stuff, uh, tomatoes and the squash and all sorts of different veggies. So. Um, but, you know, we, we are doing a thing on shorebirds, but I, I have to share some of the other species um, that, um, you know, definitely are uh, important uh, for the area. Um, there we go, I'm just moving things around here on my screen. Um, so there are a few species that birders seek out in this region. Um, it's what kind of made it, made it kind of famous. Um, you know, Cara Cara, um, we've got a, a population here in Florida. Um, obviously you go out into Texas and Arizona, a little, a little lesser in Arizona, but more in Texas, um, you start to find these guys. Um, they do like open uh, uh, prairie lands, um, they, especially cattle um, roaming around there, picking through the dung, trying to get beetles, and then they love carrion as well too. So usually if there's vultures, you're gonna find care if there are in the area. 
Um, my wife and I actually do surveys on characters, uh, which is a lot of fun as well, too. So we've really gotten to know character really well. Um, this is a bird that I actually shot down in, uh, um, or, or shot, I, when I mean shot, I mean with my camera, um, down in, uh, um, down at Joe Over Street. So, and that's one of the species that we look for around here. Um, there is, um, they go about as north, uh, probably north east of uh, Orlando, um, up in the Seminole, um, and then they, they kind of just wrap around the western part of Orlando, kind of get down to Lake Okeechobee and around that region. Um, bald eagles, obviously we have a ton of bald eagles. There is no shortage of bald eagles, um, especially in a lot of the sod areas um, and uh, uh, throughout Central Florida. In fact, I think uh, we have like the second highest population of bald eagles um, next to Alaska. Um, so, and of course, we've got the southeastern one, which is uh, a little bit smaller of a bird. Um, they go north a little bit right now, but they should be all coming back soon. Um, at, at any given point, anytime I go birding, especially in the winter, um, maybe late summer is the only time um, they don't see them. But otherwise, um, these guys, I always expect to find bald eagles, um, uh, especially in the area. And in fact, actually, I have one uh, area um, in Osceola County where there's literally five nests within a quarter of a mile of each other. Um, it's almost like community breeding, um, which is um, kind of unheard of, I, what I know from bald eagles, just because they have such a huge space that they usually like to take up. Um, it's kind of fascinating. And it's just one little area, just literally every quarter mile, there's a nest, um, it's pretty cool. Um, snail kites, obviously, is another big one that we have um, around our lakes um, down in South Florida that a lot of people come and try to get. Um, this is a nice male right there. Um, they, uh, these guys are heavily monitored. A lot of them have jewelry, and I mean by jewelry, I mean bands. Um, some of them got uh, um, uh, GPS on them now and everything. So a lot of work with the snail kites um, as they sort of, their population kind of goes, fluctuates all over the place, depending on what the lakes are doing, um, how much brush is around the lakes and things like that, that nature. Um, again, several of the places, especially Joe Over Street, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, is uh, huge with them. Um, Lake uh, Toho is another one. Um, East Lake Toho and all that. So um, let's see, swallowtail kite. Um, I think uh, the last uh, chat you guys had um, talked a lot about swallowtail kites. Um, obviously one of, uh, um, if you're a bird in Florida, this is a, a bird that's in your top five of, of liking. Um, there's just nothing more cool than a swallowtail kite. So, and then red cockaded woodpeckers, um, like I mentioned about the uh, um, uh, longleaf pines, um, you know, these guys uh, um, really are very habitat specific. They, they like the longleaf pines. Um, they have to be a certain width, um, sort of open uh, um, prairie lands with a palmetto and everything. Um, so these guys are real specific in what they like. Um, a lot of conservation work has gone into these. Um, a good friend of mine, John Hoke, um, uh, who now is managing a wildlife place out in Citrus County. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the, he managed them, these guys for a long time um, and still does. And that's how I got to knowing him, got really into the whole red cockaded thing. Um, and these are really cool woodpeckers. And whenever I'm out in the pines, out in the Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area, which is in the, uh, South Osceola County, um, it's got a good population of them. And I always try to find these guys, um, very cool woodpeckers. So, but we are talking about shorebirds. So let's move on to a little bit of shorebirds and how are we gonna find shorebirds, especially here in central Florida um, when you're away from the coast. The coast, it's easy. You just find a nice little area of muck, uh, you know, a little beach line, things like that, rocky area. And you could usually find a turnstone sanderling or something along those lines. So, but how do we find these down here? especially when um, a lot of Central Florida is made up of theme parks and franchises. Um, but once you get south of the area, you get into these open areas um, where the sod and the um, cattle all of a sudden begin. So right now in Osceola County um, alone, 29 species of shorebirds have been uh, recorded um, and accepted uh, according to eBird. Um, just bragging rights for myself, I've seen 26 of these. Um, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, hence, I've spent a lot of time staring at um, a lot of shorebirds. Um, the best time to find shorebirds? Well, first of August um, to mid-September, that's sort of the peak. However, we get a lot of wintering shorebirds down here. So you can really all of a sudden go bird for shorebirds all the way around till probably, oh, probably March 
um you know that's when we start getting some spring stuff coming back um it, fall time is sort of the best time uh for shorebirds migrating um spring migration is not as hopping um i think the birds stick a little more to their roots and don't divert and just want to get up into their um, staging areas and then get right up to the arctic for breeding um wherever they're headed um so um for here definitely the peak uh, august to mid-september um, and on any of these sod fields, um, always follow the rains, um, because if a dry sod field is not a good sod field, a wet sod field is a good sod field, at least for the birds. And in this picture right here, I've got pectoral sandpipers, just a, a small group of them um, in one of the fields. So um, now that we're going to be looking at these sod fields and birding these sod fields, there is a few things I always like to mention, especially if someone hasn't really been down there. Um, again, these sod fields are, are privately owned. Um, so we do need to take care of that. Um, and you have to know whether or not you are allowed to go onto these sod fields or not. Um, so that's the other thing. Um, most nowadays we know all who likes having birders on their property or not on their property. Um, so just, you know, go by the advice of people and locals that know the area. Um, so you can figure out kind of where you should go or where you shouldn't go really. Um, so just a couple of quick little rules that I, I always kind of go by. Drive slow. Um, no need to go fast anywhere. Um, you kick up dust, dirt, um, anything like that on the dirt roads. Usually they are not paved. So they're usually nicely just uh, um, dirt um, so that the trucks can go across them and everything. So um, make sure you drive bird watch from designated uh, roads only. Um, so a lot of them have a main road that kind of goes in and then, you know, shoots off to the different fields. Um, if you're lucky, some sod fields are cool about you driving around all their sod fields. Um, most are not. Most going to give you the main drag, and that's about it. Um, in this case, actually, um, this one that we have here is uh, Loving uh, Sod Fields, um, and they have one road goes right down the middle, um, and that's all you're allowed to do. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. So give way to sod trucks. I always just say this. Um, it's their livelihood. They're allowing us to watch. Just get out of their way. Uh, we're sort of, even though that we may have access to the roads and everything like that, it's just easier and nicer just to give the sod trucks um, the right of way um, so that, you know, they're not sitting there going, oh, no, these birders are back and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and I've worked out or several of these places, really good uh, relationships with a lot of the sod farmers um, and everything too, which is kind of nice. So um, do not walk or drive on any of the fields. This is a big thing. Um, anyone that's grown up as a farmer um, or anything along those lines, um, then you know that, um, you know, you just don't go onto somebody's fields. Um, you know, you, you break the grass, you, you make prints, um, you maybe you got vegetables, things like that. You just stay off the, the, the field. Um, stick to the, uh, uh, the main roads um, that are designated for vehicles. Um, and that's, that'll keep you out of most problems. So um, a lot of these areas are trespass, are, are you know, private property um, and everything. So, um, and again, you get down to the, some of these counties um, and they all of a sudden think they're in Texas, so. Um, okay, so now let's see where we're gonna go. So we kind of got Central Florida, well, I should say the Kissimmee, um, Osceola County area. Um, you'll notice in this map here, um, it starts up with a big round um, right off of Narcusi Road. That's actually Narcusi Road, that little white line that kind of goes to the east of that big circle up top there and then say cloud right below it. Um, that's East Lake Toho. Um, and actually the whole name is Toho Picalinga. I'm sorry. And I have never in all my years, never been able to pronounce it. So I like the shortcut Lake Toho. Um, and it's East Lake Toho and then the main Lake Toho. Um, and you'll see that one over to the West, um, a little bit. You'll see that kind of longer one just, uh, below Kissimmee. Um, that's the main lake, main lane, make Lake Toho. Um, and then you kind of drop down and you get down to Cypress Lake. Um, and then another one right below the Kissimmee, Kissimmee chain of lakes. Um, you've got uh, Lake Kissimmee and there's Lake Marion and there's Lake Jackson, which is actually in three lakes. Um, so there is a couple other um, lakes, but I don't really do too much on these. Um, I kind of just have one center road. The nice thing is there's um, a road called Canoe Creek Road. It comes right out of St. Cloud. It kind of um, kind of goes right along the turnpike, which you can see um, kind of shooting through. Um, oh, on there on the map. Let me go back. Um, and uh, uh, um, the turnpike, if you kind of follow the turnpike on a map, 
you got Canoe Creek that kind of falls south right down to it. And that goes all the way down to, I think, 41. And then that goes down to Route 60. Um, Route 60 is sort of on the southern end of Osceola County, northern end of, or actually I should, west end of Polk County. Um, and I think Indian River is down there as well, too. Um, so, um, so Osceola kind of just covers this whole big swath of lakes right here. So going from spot to spot, um, this is actually some redheads. I think I was with Deborah and her husband. Uh, we were doing Christmas bird count, actually. That's Lake Toho and then some redheads. It was just a nice shot. Um, so the first one that we start, I'm going to just start kind of up north and then just kind of kind of what I would do, say, if I'm looking for shorebirds all of a sudden and how I would kind of go about doing it. Um, kind of organizing everything and just trying to make a day of it. Um, so I'd start up north in, in Lake Rummead um, Conservation Area. Um, this is a really good spot um, that's up in here. Um, Ralph Chisholm uh, Park is another one. That's the one that's actually, it's, you know, well, it's actually a mine. It's, it's right behind all the, um, I can't get rid of that, uh, but it's right up there on the north part. That's Ralph Chisholm Park there. <laughs> Um, that one uh, is a really good spot. It's got one little beach area um, that they uh, that, that the town made, and you kind of just pull into the driveway, and it's probably about a couple hundred yards of beach. And amazingly, um, when there's no people there or anything, um, you can actually get some pretty decent shorebirds. Um, solitary sandpipers, which I have here on the right, um, that's actually a wintering bird, which is actually pretty rare um, for the area. Um, which was kind of nice. And then solitary sandpipers. So just to kind of give you an idea of where these guys are going, um, you notice where the blue is, that's non-breeding, migrations, all the yellow, and then they go way, way up north. Um, I actually thought they tipped in a little bit more into northern Michigan. I thought I remember hearing about some of the um, uh, bogs up there and some of the pools that they actually do breed in there. But um, anyhow, um, you can see these guys, um, you know, just to give you an idea, most of these birds are all heading way up north. Um, they're not breeding in our area. A few of them do, but most are going way, way up north, um, up into the tundra um, and all around that region. And then they go south. So they're really, they're using the United States almost just for breeding or for feeding rather. And so they're coming down looking for staging areas as they mix, make their next jump. And then as you can see, solitaries go all the way down. Um, so that's why I guess they got them out there in the Caribbeans and everything like that. But again, to get a winter bird um, is pretty cool. So um, and uh, you can see actually the first bird that I showed was actually a winter plumage bird, um, may have even been a juvenile from that year. Um, but uh, you can see two here, the two littler ones with the white eye ring. Um, that's very uh, traditional solitary with the speckling. Um, and then there's the yellow legs for comparison, uh, probably a greater in the back there. Semi palmated plovers. This is another one that a lot of times gets into East Lake Toho. Um, again, it's a little more of a beachy kind of area because um, actually, if you you take Ralph Chisholm and then if you kind of go a little bit more south um, to Lakefront Park in uh, St. Cloud, um, that's got another little more public beach area. Um, I don't really recommend it. If you're going to hit that, just hit it early in the morning. Um, that's actually where these birds were shot right here. Um, because they just there's a volleyball field or um, beach volleyball going on there and everything. So if you're going to get there, get there early. Um, but it can hold some shorebirds, um, especially if the water level is low. Um, they'll kind of get out in a little bit. And I know we've had western and semi palmated uh, sandpiper during migration and stuff. So these guys here were spring. Um, and they looking really uh, uh, eye popping here, um, the semi palmated plovers. Um, and again, um, this is more of a, I think, wintering bird, uh, winter plumage bird here. Um, and again, you can see what these guys are doing. Um, you know, they, they're wintering all on the coast, um, going all the way down. Um, really, you even notice they, they just migration. That's the only time that they really ever come inland. Um, and they will do it in force. You'll get good numbers of them, um, you know, coming through, especially in Osceola County and some of the areas. Um, but, but they do seem, for whatever reason, they do like um, uh, East Lake Toho, um, maybe because it's just a little more sandy. Um, but uh, anyhow, so. And semi palmated sandpiper, this is another one. This is another good one to get. Um, again, it's got a very small window um, when it actually um, likes to be in Florida. Um, and uh, um, it's purely just during their migration, and that's about it. 
Um, here's their map. You can see they don't even look, barely even got, I think they go all the way down into South America as well too. Um, so, I mean, they've just got it barely in uh, Central America there. Um, uh, so you can see that that bird literally, and look how high it goes up and breathes way, way, way up there um and everything but again we get them in pretty good numbers especially if you go out to the coast or something like that um during migration you can get you know a good good horde of them um and in inland um we get them in twos and threes and they're usually in with least sandpipers um you always kind of look why we look for them because they're just a little more more brighter white um and pop out in size a little bit over the least and we get a lot of these sandpipers um pretty much almost year round uh, with birds that don't migrate um there's the least sandpiper right here. Some breeding birds, um, most common of our, any of our peeps. Peeps, they, they're all these uh, small guys, bears, white rumped, uh, semi-pollinated, uh, least uh, Western. Uh, we just kind of call them peeps for short. Um, and uh, um, that's, like I said, we, we, you, you can get flocks of 7,500 uh, least sandpipers in some of these sod fields. Um, so generally, if you always think in your head, you see a lot of little guys, little brownie, especially with the, the breast, almost look like a tiny little pectoral. Um, you can kind of say, okay, these are going to be least sandpipers, and then you sort of sort from them from that point. Um, again, you can see where these guys are going. Um, they winter a lot more in the southern part of the United States. Um, I don't know how far, far south they go, um, but you can see that they, they do winter very heavily around us, and they migrate, and again, go way up north. Um, in order to breed. It's kind of neat. Um, this is a, uh, I'm going to say that looks like probably a worn juvenile um, or winter plumage, probably fall bird um, that I've got here. Um, but they're always, the big thing is their yellow feet. Um, their yellow feet, whereas most of the other peeps are all have yellow or black feet, um, and then very browny all over, all the way down into the breast um, area um, generally. So, and then this is a spotted sandpiper. Um, and uh, again, this is another one that that's pretty common, especially along most all the lakes. Um, you look for it doing its bobbin thing. Um, this is a winter bird or a juvenile bird. Um, does not have the spots, but uh, trust me, this spotted sandpiper. Um, and again, I didn't really add a male spotted because honestly, in Central Florida, I've only seen like a couple of really nice uh, adult birds. Um, all the other ones are all molting or juveniles when they kind of come through or we get them around us. Um, like I said, late winter is when you usually find a nicer looking bird um, that's got all the spots and everything. Um, but uh, so I kind of chose these younger looking birds um, to kind of show off because that's kind of what you almost see more. Um, but if you know spotted, then you know, like you start to see the spots, they're pretty obvious. Um, and then they got a little wag, a little bob to their walk. Um, the other thing is when they fly, they have a very distinct uh, flight where they kind of almost cup their wings and kind of flutter um, very distinctly and usually have a couple call notes that you can pick out as well too. And as you can see, they breed much more into the United States. They go way up north, obviously, but um, you know, these guys are all the way down. And um, I know like kind of neat when I was in New Hampshire, um, on Isle of Shoals, um, going out um, to one of the islands out there and they were actually breeding out on the island off the coast of New Hampshire, which was kind of neat. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna move a little more south now. So we, we've kind of come in the St. Cloud. Uh, we've now moved down, we're on the Canoe Creek Road. Remember that, I'm gonna say that a few times, Canoe Creek Road, that's the main road that just shoots right down the center and everything is pretty much off of that. Um, this is Loving Sod Farms. Um, it's actually an, an e-bird. I need to update it. It used to be H&H &H, uh, Sod Fields. Um, it's now been bought out by this company right here. So you'll look for them on the left. Um, and again, this is one of these ones that just stay on the center road. Um, they do have a gate there. Um, it's not always locked, but I always go if the late gate's closed, there's a reason it's closed. So um, don't go in. Um, the nice thing is these guys work on the weekends, so you can get out there on Sunday. Um, as long as the gate's open, there's also there's a conservation area um, that is down there as well, too. So they kind of do have to kind of keep it open for the public for that. Um, I've actually never birded the conservation area, but um, certainly I've been down the sod fields quite a bit. Um, this place is very famed for upland sandpipers. Um, again, one of my favorite uh, sandpipers. Um, you know, this is a bigger bird, long neck, big eye, um, short little bill. Um, great call as it was playing in the beginning. Um, it's sort of the, the, two, the true grass peep. Um, and uh, um, I just, I don't know, I've seen these up and breeding up north. They're really nice. Um, and we get a good bunch of them in our area throughout the region um, through the uh, uh, 
all these sod farms that I'm going to show in here. I don't know why. Um, they do pop up, obviously, other places. Um, but for whatever reason, we get a really good concentration of upland sandpipers almost yearly. Um, we get them sometimes in the spring, um, but mostly in the fall. And in fact, this year we had one the beginning of July. Uh, I can't remember the exact date, but that blew out. At least my earliest record before that was the end of July. And we had birds, I think it was like the second week of July. Um, pretty incredible to have them that early. Um, and it was really a treat to see him. And in fact, it was about five birds. And I think a lot of people did get to see, it was neat, so. Um, and American Golden Plovers, this is another one. That's always a target bird. Um, I think I kind of put, yeah, their, their breeding range um, on the next slide here. Um, so this is also another famed one um, that goes a great distance. And in fact, you can see, it didn't even show where they winters because it's basically down in South America. Um, these guys go long, long distance. But if you look at their track, you can see that Florida really isn't even on it other than sort of migration starts. Um, but, um, you know, basically, um, that's always a target bird. Like, I know there's one that's down in Palm Beach County right now, um, but this is one that we're always looking for. And we were sort of, I don't know if it was a storm system or it was something that came through during the fall. Um, and, uh, um, oops. There we go. And there was these birds, actually, these were the ones where I came down in that loving uh, sod farm was H&H &H at the time. Um, they actually called and I whipped around and turned it with about five, five or six of them that landed in the field. Um, very distinct pattern, black cap, um, smaller looking um, than their cousin, sort of the uh, black bellied. So let's see. And this is Joe Overstreet. So we've kind of left off at uh, this H&H &H sod farm. Now at Jover Street um, and Jover Street, Canoe Creek Road. There we go. This is sort of the big famous place. Um, a lot of people that have birded the area, they know Jover Street. Um, and basically, if you can kind of look at the map, you can see the patchy work of the sod farms. And if you see that road that kind of cuts right down, I believe that is Jover Street right there. Um, that's coming off it, or actually rather, sorry, it's up there on the corner up there. So just north uh, of all the patchiness, um, the 523, um, that's Canoe Creek, and then uh, um, Joe Overstreet comes off that. So you can see that's the only road you get the bird on. So you can see for miles that the sod farms go out, but we only get the sort of the front part. We can only bird along the main road. Um, you can't go in. And trust me, I have. I've had conversations with the managers there and everything like that. Good people, but it's just a liability thing. They just don't want you out there. There are a lot of movement. Um, they don't need us getting hurt or anything like that. So, but we've done pretty good following these sod fields. Um, and then Jova Street, you follow it all the way down. It goes down to the marina, um, which again, for itself, can be actually pretty good, especially if the water levels are low and there's a lot of muck. Um, you can get things down there. Pectoral sandpipers. This is a huge one um, that we uh, get in the area. Um, these guys can come in really big numbers. I have probably the biggest flock that I think that I've seen is probably a couple hundred birds. Um, you know, in a sod field. Um, they're really spectacular. I love watching them. If you ever just take a chance to get a big flock of uh, pectoral sandpipers, just watch them. They're so amusing. Um, you know, they, they sort of uh, uh, very animated, um, usually always annoyed with something. They ruffle up and puff their feathers out, chasing one around. I mean, they're just very animated and a lot of fun to watch, um, making a lot of calls and everything. Um, and again, it, it to me almost looks like a leaf sandpiper on steroids. Um, it's uh, just a big brownie uh, um, shorebird. Um, again, this is a bird that's actually in high breeding plumage right here. Um, and uh, you can see again where these guys are coming through, even though we get them in really good numbers um, during migration. But you can see they're going all the way up and then they basically cover almost all of South America in the winter. Um, so kind of cool that they're all coming up there and a lot of them are hitting uh, Florida. Um, and again, a lot of the sod fields will have a lot of pectoral, especially in the fall, uh, coming through. Um, again, this is a bigger size, more chunkier uh, um, uh, shorebird um, with a nice yellow feet, um, nice uh, patterning on, pattern on the back, um, and kind of a little bit of a cap. Um, and of course, the one we always look for is a sharp tail. I don't know if a sharp tail has actually ever been seen in Florida yet, um, but it's always worth checking out all the pectorals. 
Um, let's see, yellow legs. Um, I've got uh, these look mostly all greater yellow legs here. I don't think I see a lesser in there. Uh, I'm going to talk about in a second about these con weird concentrations of uh, yellow legs that we get, um, especially in the late winter. I think our area is a bit of a staging area for probably all the local yellow legs. Um, we get these huge flocks of, you know, of upwards of 100 plus uh, yellow legs and mostly all graders with a few lessers dabbed in. And uh, um, but it's kind of neat. Um, and again, if you're, you know, looking for some excitement in the winter and all that, I mean, you know, all of a sudden going through 100 plus yellow legs is pretty cool, um, especially when they're all kind of clustered up like that. Um, again, this was from Joe Overstreet, um, one of the side pools um, just south of the sod fields. Um, these guys were roosting it. Um, this is a lesser yellow legs. Um, so we get more graders and, and obviously less lesser yellow legs. Um, and, uh, you know, I've sat, I've argued with good friends uh, forever and ever um, about sort of um, who, who, you know, what is what. Uh, and, you know, is it bigger? Is it smaller? Is it, you know, brill curved and all this and everything? Um, usually, if you can just get them side by side like that. Um, then you don't have to worry about anything. You go, okay, great. Okay, I can see the small guy. I can see the big guy. Okay, we can pretty much done. We got greater and lesser. Um, so one of my favorite photos, uh, especially the birds are more or less facing the same direction. Um, so it really shows you how much of a size difference. But boy, I tell you, that overlaps a little bit too. So you got to be careful. Black neck stilts um, will always pop up. They actually breed in a couple of locations. They uh, do breed sometimes to Lake Kissimmee down by Joe Overstreet. Um, then they also get uh, breed down to Lake Marion as well too. Um, so local breeders and then sort of concentrate before they, um, during migration, um, which is kind of neat because they're always kind of noisy out there and everything. Um, black belly plovers, um, another one that's always fun to, to get in the, um, so the central part of Florida. Um, the nice big bulky shorebird. Um, if you can get them in nice color like this, this is obviously a breeding bird. Um, you know, it's always very flashy and looks nice, especially in a nice green grass. However, we generally get these guys, big gray plumps uh, that are just out in the field. Uh, but again, they're nice big and so you can pick them out um, and everything. Um, you know, it, they, I think they still come up rare as uh, on eBird, but it, probably not at this point. Um, we, we get quite a few during migration. Um, that kind of hang out for a while. Um, I know there was some that was around, I think a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, usually they're out, if you're looking at all of the fields um, on the pastures and stuff like that, you can find them. Um, so just some of the other stuff uh, that we do find, um, Dunlin, um, I've only had a few of those. Um, actually at uh, um, uh, Running Mead um, Preserve uh, up uh, East Lake Toho. Um, and that little beachy area that I was talking about earlier, um, we had a couple of dun Dunlin running around there. Um, this is a wintering bird, obviously a breeding bird is nice and spectacular. Um, but again, I'm assuming if any Dunlin, at least that I have seen or heard, are more or less gonna look like this guy on the left, um, very pale, very gray, um, thick bill, a little bit of a curve to it. Um, so um, usually if I find them, they're usually around dowagers. Um, to the right, I've got greater dowagers or sorry, long-billed dowagers. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I got buff-breasted sandpipers. So this is another big target for, for a lot of people in uh, Osceola County and uh, around the sod fields. Um, again, it's got a very, very small window. Um, and I kind of went on eBird and kind of looked to see, you know, where people have had reported them. And it was August 15th to September 15th. That is literally your window. Um, after that, these birds are gone. Um, and, and it's, it's almost even to me, it almost seems less than that. Um, literally, if you took sort of the last week of August and the first week of September, um, that's your, your, your best point in trying to get them. Um, we've got along Jover Street. So if you're driving down Jover Street and on the right side, and you're heading south, um, you'll have come to the last sod field. That is, it's the last sod field um, on the right. And that is the famous buff-breasted sandpiper uh, field. Um, a lot of times they're found in there. I don't know why. It's actually this field generally has the most shorebirds in it. Um, and then the next one over, it floods a little bit. Um, you can get stuff in the back where we actually did. I got my first Wilson's fowler rope, which is only a, one of a couple of records um, actually in Osceola County. It's the a breeding bird on the right right there. The buff-breast did, um, you know, just look for reports and look for them. Like, obviously, you can see them next to killdeer, a little bit smaller, very buffy in color. Um, but once you get on them, you can see them. 
Um, but again, if you're going to look for them, you know, look for that small little window. Um, it's not one that you kind of go, oh, let's just go out birding, see if we can find a buff resid. You, you've got to time yourself and go in and get it um, and see if you can find one. Um, last year, I don't think we had one reported, um, but down in uh, Avon, um, South 27, um, there's some sod fields down there. I think they've had a couple of them. And, and usually historically, I think that place usually gets a few of them. Um, so I showed you a Wilson's follow up in there. I wanted to tease you a little bit because they're beautiful birds. However, unfortunately, what we're going to get is this guy, this very white, pale, uh, gray bird. Um, this is primarily what we get most of the time. Um, and again, the bird that I had was way too far out for a photograph. This was actually in another location, but um, this is basically what you're looking for is sort of this whitish bird with a needle black, uh, needle like uh, black bill um, kind of running around, um, usually in the water um, like Fowler Oak do. Um, so um, Jover Street isn't just known for its shorebirds. Um, it does get other things. So in the winter time, you can always check the fields out for um, uh, look for American Pippin um, or Common. There was a couple of big flocks out there this year, which was really neat. Um, probably about almost up to 100 birds. Um, so it's kind of neat seeing these guys run around. Um, this is generally how if you're going to see a scissor tail fly catcher, this is generally how we see it. Uh, way out in the back fields, but if you're lucky enough, um, oh, I was going to show you, it's my next picture, uh, I was going to say, but if you're lucky enough, you get to see this guy right here um, when he's up nice and close uh, to the fence line and you can get a really decent picture. The cool thing about these birds is two of them, and if I go back to this slide right here, um, these guys are now coming, I think they're coming on their fourth uh, winter now here at Jover Street. Um, there was originally three. Now it's been down to two the last couple of years. And I put the map in here real quick, just so you can see that we get, you know, South Florida gets a little bit of a population. But if anyone knows, especially burning around Lake Apopka, there's a lot more wintering scissor tail fly catchers around that region. So you can actually move that blue line up a little bit to the central part. Um, and again, we're kind of proud of our birds because um, they've been hanging around now for four years. Um, so it's a nice way to get a nice rarity. Um, they're usually all the way kind of, you're driving down Jover Street, you drive all the way down right before you get to the Oak Line where the houses are. There's a horse pasture on the right and on the left. And you just look along the fence line and you hopefully will see the birds. So, um, and I would hope in a couple of months that they will return again. Uh, metal larks, a lot of metal larks. If you love singing metal larks and the nice yellow of the metal lark, um, they are all over the place. Um, great breeding populations, a lot of youngsters right now, which look really funky and they're all scruffy and trying to learn how to do their calls. So there's all sorts of funkiness going on with metal larks out there right now. Sandhill cranes, we got a huge population of uh, wintering uh, um, migratory birds and plus our local birds there. Um, so you can get a flocks, a couple hundred birds there. Um, this was just a group that was just starting to take off. Um, we also have had historically uh, hooping cranes around. And uh, those guys, um, and well, the one bird that was closest is we, we don't think is around anymore. Um, but there are some birds down in Polk County left over from migratory. And that's probably a whole big thing for a whole nother conversation. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it is well worth it if you get a group of sand hills around here, make sure that there's not a gigantic white one with a red cap on it. Um, which could be a leftover uh, hooping crane. Um, Jover Street also is famed for uh, Lake Kissimmee, really um, having black skimmers, um, one of the few inland uh, uh, wintering populations of black skimmers. Um, it varies from, you know, 20 birds down to just a couple birds. This was just a bird that was there, um, usually down by the marina on the dock. Um, it'll come in for resting. A lot of gulls and terns will do that as well. You get mostly ringbills, a couple of herrings, um, and a lot of foresters. Um, so, okay, so let's move on to the next area, Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area, which again, all on its own is a whole big conversation, um, just because of the great place of birding it is. Um, it, and so we'll just kind of cut right to Lake Jackson. This is slowly um, becoming a bit of a shorebird spot. Um, we actually had Willet there um, this uh, uh, year. Um, the spring, which was really cool. Um, you don't always get the uh, willet in inland, um, we did in this case. Um, and so out here, it's a big fisherman's area. You enter it coming down Canoe Creek, you go off of uh, Prairie Lakes unit and then drive in from there. And then you see a sign to Lake Jackson and you just follow that all the way to the little marina that they have there. They actually made a nice little uh, um, 
um, uh, hut or uh, a viewing area um, with a nice little uh, kind of big boardwalk out to it. Um, so you can kind of look out a little more and kind of off into the sort of eastern part of the lake. Um, you, that's where we've been getting some shorebirds, um, getting a lot of leese. Um, like I said, there was a will, a couple of willets that were there this year. Um, we've also had um, uh, um, uh, some of the dowagers as well too. Um, showing up at that spot. So that so that's another location that you can hit up. And moving more south, we go down to Lake Marion. Um, this is where I actually have a lot of fun um, heading down here. It's a little bit further down. And it's about the mo most southern that I go, at least for a day. Um, Lake Marion, um, the Paradise RV mobile home park that's down there. Um, you can go straight down the center. Um, there's a marina right there, um, right past the community. Um, and you can kind of out look out there, but it's more set up for boats and everything. And occasionally you'll get like in the grasses, you'll get like a flock of leaves for sandpipers, <coughs> excuse me, or just another place to view um, the lake itself. But going a little bit north out of town um, there, but uh, by literally like a half a mile, um, Lake Mary and the boat ramp, public boat ramp. Um, if you kind of go to the north side of it, um, look out along the lake. Um, there's a, actually, if you kind of where that pin, that gray pin is, and if you kind of go north of there along the edge, you kind of butts out a little bit right where the K is actually where Lake Marion is in there on the on the chart, on the map here. Um, that area right there is got uh, always usually is very mucky, and it is a huge hotbed for shorebirds, especially snipe, um, as you have a picture of here on the left. Um, Willet over here on the right. This is actually the eastern that I actually found during uh, springtime. Um, another rare sighting of a willet. And it's actually, I've only seen a few willets now uh, in Osceola County, or at least in Central Florida. Um, plenty in the, on the coast, but just not inland. Um, this also place also gets um, huge numbers of uh, dowagers. Uh, well, huge numbers, I should say a flock of them, but it does get huge numbers of yellow legs. Um, these are the dowagers right here. Um, these are long-billed dowagers primarily. We only have long-billed dowagers. Um, if you say short-billed, um, be ready to have pictures. Uh, you may need a sketch. You may need um, sort of legal notification that you saw a short-billed dowager. You may have to give up your firstborn. I'm not quite sure. Um, but there is quite the debate about whether or not short builds actually ever come inland. Um, I have personally found only two short builds that I can confirm um, that were in Osceola County, and it was a flock with a flock of about 75 long build. Um, and uh, um, it took me about a month to ID them. I never got pictures of them, unfortunately, because they were too far out, but I looked at them almost weekly. Um, and then finally was able to, to pick out the two short builds. Um, that were in there. Um, but primarily, just always default to long build and then keep your short builds to the uh, coast. Um, unless you're at Merritt Island where both of them will hang out and all that. Um, but uh, anyhow, that's just generally the, the rule of thumb is long build inland, short builds uh, uh, along the coast. Um, there's another long build dowager, just size comparison with uh, Kildares. This is generally how most of our dowagers look, unless they're um, hanging out towards breeding and they start to get some more color on them. Um, this is the other thing at Lake Marion, there's 51 yellow legs just in this flock. And then there was about another 40 plus that were actually behind these guys. So um, I just call them yellow legs. There's probably mostly all graders, but there are a few lessers in there. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, so um, again, this is where I was kind of talking about late winter. Um, I started noticing, um, especially Jova Street in this location, these constant herds of uh, uh, yellow legs coming together. Um, and, uh, you know, it was 100 plus birds that were gathering. Um, so I'm assuming these are staging areas as they're getting ready to go north. I don't see it so much in the beginning part of the winter. I just see it more near the end of winter. <clears throat> so give me. And, uh, um, so, but again, it's pretty cool to kind of go through them. You see a lot of birds like that. You're all of a sudden like, ooh, it's really fun to see uh, versus one singles and, and all that. Actually, can anyone actually pick out the uh, lesser? I can see a lesser almost dead center, <clears throat> a little smaller of a guy right there. So kind of neat uh, inland winter time that you could all of a sudden get, you know, 100 plus of these guys um, again, which is really neat. Um, again, Lake Marion also has got a few horses roaming around. It's got cattle. And next, you can see the yellow legs right there in front. And then black neck stilt breed um, along the shoreline, um, which is always fun. Um, I don't know why. It's literally just a little nook um, that kind of bows out a little bit or blows in. 
and it just creates this real mucky area and just shorebirds love it every year. So um, I hit it whenever I can. Um, well worth it. Um, so that basically kind of tours us all the way through um, Osceola County um, and where I kind of do my shorebirding and how I kind of put it all together. Um, and uh, that's uh, pretty much what I've got. And I think, I guess I'm ready for any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Hopefully I didn't okay. put everyone to sleep there. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so I've just got one so far. Everybody, uh, please put some more questions in the chat. Um, Jonathan asked, um, can you say something about freshwater versus saltwater birds um, and species that frequent both or committed to one salt or fresh? And I think you have all along, but if you want to reiterate. Yeah. yeah, so basically, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, basically, you have sort of your, 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 your more saltwater birds, your sanderlings, your ruddy turnstones. Um, you know, the short build, I talked about the dowager, short build versus long build. Um, you know, so there are certain shorebirds that pretty much stick to like a wimbrel or something like that, but they will come across. There's actually one record of uh, uh, three wimbrels flying across East Lake Toho. Um, and, um, you know, those guys generally always stick to the shoreline. However, you get a storm or you just get a wayward bird and they'll come inland. So it's not to say they won't. And I believe like Polk County's got a red knot. You know, that's another one that you'd always find just along the shoreline. Um, so they can mingle. So there are different species. Pectorals are sort of more famed for being inland, but you can find them along the coast quite a bit as well too. Um, spotted solitary sandpipers, those guys are more generally inland, more freshwater. Um, but again, you can find them along saltwater. So saltwater, I think you can find a higher diversity, and, um, you know, just for species. When you come inland, well, you start to narrow your pocket, but then you get excited. Like I, we had ruddy turns, I found my first ruddy turnstones last year over at that Loving Sod Fields, um, and that was awesome. Um, I totally, uh, um, you know, that was a great find. And the funny thing is, at the same time, uh, Tom Rodriguez, who does quite a bit, um, he uh, had the Sanderling uh, that was over in Leafman. I missed that bird. Uh, so that was a real bummer. But uh, yeah, so there is definitely a difference, um, you know, but they do mingle both on either side. Hopefully okay. they answer. Okay, great. And um, same Jonathan would like to know more about how you distinguish clovers and sandpipers. <laughs> um, well, the best thing is, is get a really good book here. Oh, well, I was going to say, I, well, I don't have the camera on me, but the, um, the Shorebird Guide, um, Michael O'Brien, Richard Crosley, and Kevin Carlson. Um, it's a book that I really like um, because it kind of silhouettes the birds a little bit, takes away their plumages and things like that. And, uh, um, you know, kind of help you uh, to pick what you're looking for. So plovers generally are more upright, uh, more walkers. Um, you know, when the field and your, and your um, you know, your, your sandpipers, um, those generally are a little more sh shorter, uh, sometimes a more longer build. Um, it's just structurally, they're just a little more compact. Um, you know, that's, that's in a real rough uh, um, word. That's kind of how it goes, um, is that they're just plovers are more upright and short and sand or sandpipers are just more short and more stout um i think is the best way to kind of put it so um okay. the bill wise lovers usually have a, a, a thicker smaller bill um generally as well too okay and any differences on habitat and migration um feeding that you can point out about different between those two well, between the two, so plovers are more, like I said, they're more upright, they're more walking upright. Um, and when they they, they kind of dip, they, they kind of take half their body and, you know, they kind of hit the ground, you know, foraging for things. Um, and then they're, you know, erect right back up, their heads all the way back up, you know, or sandpipers, they're more compact, there's less neck. Um, so you get more probing. They're shorter to the ground. They're more pro, 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 looking around for things. Um, maybe a little more active, but then again, I've seen buff breasteds go crazy as well, um, running around the field for whatever reason. So, <clears throat> so I think feeding wise, uh, habitat wise, I think you're going to find your plovers more in your grassy areas. Um, but then again, tell a semi palmated plover that, um, you know, because he likes the beach just as much as anybody. Um, so really, I think habitat goes more towards um, 
I think is a lesser of a factor um, unless you get in like golden plovers. Golden plovers generally like more inland. They like the pastures more than say like a black bellied plover, which, you know, still will be out in the pastures, but they generally prefer more the coast um, and everything. But then again, I've seen American golden plovers on the coast too. Um, so, um, but I think more the habitat, more to structure of the bird um, than really the habitat um, and deciphering the two different ones. Okay, um, this is kind of a different question, but what's the effect of pesticides on the grass? <laughs> well, that is a million dollar question. Um, and we just hope that they're using all the great chemicals that they're supposed to be using. Um, you know, we'd have a lot of problems if we started going around testing all the uh, um, uh, sod farms. Um, obviously, um, the golf courses have a bad reputation for putting a lot of chemicals they have historically. Um, the good thing, at least, is that these are not on a golf course yet, so they haven't been absolutely inundated with uh, pesticides and things like that. They do have some funky orange spray that they put out there, and yes, the person wears a respirator when they're driving around the, uh, the, the, the vehicle and everything, um, but I will say it's an open vehicle so um but uh um i you know i don't really know offhand exactly what they use obviously they use some things um to keep bugs and weeds down um and really you know i haven't heard enough studies i mean we can we know that bird numbers are down regardless um and uh um you know i think at this point um you know i i've seen well if it's anything i've i, I believed i've seen the same three Upland sandpipers come back for three years in a row at the eight, at the loving sod farms. It was always at three birds. It was always in spring. And they were always in the same field, and for three years. So I assumed I had to assume that they were the same birds coming back. So that's pretty good. At least three years it didn't wipe them out. So um, hopefully, just it's not as bad as as what we what we want to think. <laughs> okay. And another question is, what are you apt to see at Kissimmee Prairie State Park? Uh, Kissimmee Prairie State Park, um, I think more because that's more uh, prairie, heavier grasses. Um, I haven't burned down there that much other than looking for like, uh, uh, well, the Florida grasshopper slope barrel, um, hairy woodpeckers. Um, I think it's less, I, you, maybe along some of the lake, you might find some stuff, um, especially along some of the, you know, if you get in some marshy areas, um, you're going to find similar to what you would, what I've been talking about. Um, but I think location, I, I do hear that they do get upland sandpipers out there in the prairies every once in a while. Um, but again, you really need that water to, to bring in the shorebirds. Okay. Any reels, what did I say? Something about have you found yellow rails, black rails in these areas? Uh, neither one. I haven't found any of the rails. Um, generally, you get into more of the marshlands. Um, we did have black rails calling down in the Route 60 section, um, Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area. Uh, that's Terrence from Louisiana. And she asked uh, about more about upland sandpipers because uh, she sees them at a place called Turfgrass Road, an inland area near a landfill. So anything else? To say about them? Uh, well, upland sandpipers, uh, upland sandpipers are really cool. Um, again, it's a, more of an upright uh, shorebird. Um, they're also very visible. Um, they've got a great call, which I played earlier. Um, they are more of a prairie lands bird. Um, they breed more inland. They go more out in west, like if you go out to uh, Minnesota, northern Michigan. Um, they even breed in uh, New Hampshire, coastal New Hampshire, off of Pease Air Force Base. Uh, they have some areas there. Now, the, the cool thing about them is that when they're doing their call, they will get up on a fence post and out in the open and do their call. And then they've actually got a flight um, that they do whilst they're making their call. Um, and you can actually almost imitate it. Um, um, and they'll actually return uh, the call as well, too, and kind of fly up on you and then they fly back down. Um, so they're they're more of a, a true grassland shorebird, um, shall we say? And I think that's what I like about them the most. Um, they're also famous for doing the chicken walk, um, how they walk. Um, they don't walk like a normal shorebird by any means. Um, they kind of strut around um, and everything. Um, and so um, these guys are really cool. Um, they they love the sod fields. They love the pastures. Um, you don't see them on the coast very often. Um, and they will go right up and breed up in their heartlands as well, too. So in the U.S., which is kind of neat. Is that call and display for the upland only during breeding and at breeding locations, or will they do that when they come through? Um, generally, only on the breeding grounds. You may hear it a little bit in the spring, but that's just because their hormones are starting to rage and, you know, get some going. Um, generally, they more have a pip-pip type call that you'll hear 
um, as an alarm type call when it's in the off season. Okay, any last questions? These have been really good ones. Our wonderful presentation, everyone says, and thank you so much, Chris, really was great. Thank you, that was All a lot right. of fun. Okay, night everybody and hope to see you next week. Take care. I'm Thank gonna you. End ending the presentation. <laughs>